if sound is good. It sounds like it's good between us. Yep, I can hear you. Okay, sweet. So everybody else should. Yeah. Yeah. Do we have it up? Oh, J uh, three G three farms is in here. Okay, perfect. Okay. All right. Well, we're letting people kind of like come in. Um, we put out some notifications and update it, remind it people that we're going to be doing a live this evening. Oh, are you? Okay, perfect. Okay, good. So we have with us this evening, Mary of Mary's Heirloom Seeds, which we followed when you were in California and kind of mm -hmm. like watched some stuff. And now <laughs> you are in our hood. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And so it's really cool for us to see you kind of like evolve and kind of end up not very far from us. No, uh, not far at all. No. And in, in terms of Texas, you could be a couple hours away and you're just down the road from what I understand. So. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, yeah uh, that is a long drive. <laughs> it's like all of Europe um, in Texas. <laughs> But um, so one of the big things is we're waiting for people to come in that we had for you is um, why did you start a seed company? That, that's like really that, cool. That's literally the one of the first questions people ask me, even uh, like one of the mail carriers that picks up our seed orders when we first moved here. She's like, how did you get into that? So it's. It started kind of a, a long time ago. I grew up not necessarily farming, but I did have family members who grew food. So it was always something that I was really interested in. But really I got more serious in early 2000s when I started learning more about what was going into our food, uh, what not just in the farming part of it, but kind of what you, you're getting at the grocery store. And I was kind of thinking like we needed a healthier option and I was already growing my own food. So I really wanted to, to offer something, not just the seeds, but to help you grow the seeds. So there was kind of a, I saw an opportunity to kind of help more people grow food and I just ran with it. So my follow up question on that is, is because only in the beginning of us starting gardening heirloom came out. Why heirloom seeds? So I really like uh, one of the things I have on my table. I'll share with you later. I really like the history. Some of these varieties have such a deep, rich history that when you start reading in it uh, about these certain varieties, it's hard not to get excited. I get really excited. I, I call myself a seed nerd or a garden nerd sometimes because you really like look at the, the background on these and they're not necessarily something like, you know, oh, this was created a couple years ago. It's like this has been growing, for example, in Florida since the 1500s we have documented. So being able to not only have a history of that, but also um, knowing that I can grow that save those seeds and grow it next year and not necessarily have to keep going back and buying more. And yes, I'm a seed company, but my ultimate goal is to help people grow a more healthier, sustainable garden mm -hmm. and not having to go back and buy every single seed every single year is it's important if you really want a more sustainable homestead. And absolutely. Being a history buff myself, I love the stories behind yeah. the seeds. <laughs> yeah, that was a big thing. My question is, so you, you started out in Cali. Why Texas? Okay, so actually, I started in South Florida. So okay. We have, a, we have a, that was one of the things that I had mentioned. I have experience growing in three different zones and that <laughs> gives you a, it gives me a more unique opportunity to share my knowledge with a broader span of people, I guess. So mm -hmm. I started Mary's heirloom seeds back in 2011. Uh, I was living in Hollywood, Florida uh, with my husband and he's from West Texas. So okay. 
I actually moved back to San Diego to be closer to family after my dad broke his neck and he needed a little more help or, and I was also a little homesick for my family. All of my family lives within uh, like a 30 minute drive from each other. So I went back, I kept with my business. I also helped run his business. Um, the and then, shop, right? Yes, he has a skateboard shop. He's been in the industry since before I was born. So um, is that how he broke his neck? Surfing. <laughs> okay, okay. He broke his neck surfing. So it was one of those things, and we're we're it's actually still a family owned and operated company. My sister, my youngest sister now runs the shop. Uh, she's a sponsored surfer and skateboarder. So uh, we have an, an interesting, uh, unique family as well. So uh, from South Florida to Southern California and now East Texas. And I, I got to say, I do love East Texas. I like the seasons. Uh, it has come with its own um, interesting gardening techniques. We definitely yeah. have more pest issues here than I did in Southern California, but uh, not as bad as it was in South Florida. So I will say that's a bonus. So you've been here for about a year now, right? Yeah, a little over a year. So don't judge us on this crazy. No. <laughs> it's been crazy. <laughs> Everybody has said that. It is crazy here. So we had a freeze in October this year. Yes. But we we didn't have our first frost last year until November 22nd in my in my region. Mm -hmm. So I lost a month. I lo I did lose some of my stuff because I wasn't I wasn't prepared. So uh, it, again, in in South Florida, you get uh, one day. <laughs> you have what we call uh, summer, a uh, hotter summer. And February. And <laughs> so that's that. And then in Southern California, you you have a little bit of cold. We were more in the mountains, so we did get a little bit of cold, but not like East Texas. Yeah, so here in Texas, we, we said we don't have a season. We have temperatures. So uh, <laughs> it's, it's just been crazy. So last year we had the ice storm. This year we had... Wait a second. No, we had the snowstorm. This year we had the ice that, storm. The snowmageddon. Yeah. He was in Florida while I was covering. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I got to tell everybody about that. Yeah, yeah. she tells every time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but this, and then this year we had crazy extreme heat. So, how did that affect your garden? In your so, garden. that was a funny. I, I've referred to this often in the last year. When I first moved here in June of last year, I started a garden on January on July 1st. And I actually had someone kind of like heckle me in an email. You, <laughs> you can't grow anything in Texas in July. And if you don't know me, you may not, you know, but my brain said, watch me. And I had a fantastic garden. So I will say that I did have like this amazing harvest right away. So I, I was super excited. This year was hotter uh, and I did lose some things, but I also was able to kind of fine tune what I want to grow next year that did really well. Um, and every year is totally different in the garden. Yes. There's there's no season that's the same. There's no month that's going to be the same temperature. Uh, so whatever might have done fantastic this year may not do fantastic next year. So I learn every year. And, of course, now that I'm in a new state, I'm learning even more. Um, and I <laughs> think those – easy states. <laughs> I, I take them as a, a learning experience versus looking at it as a failure. So – I'm excited to grow even more stuff. If la if this year was kind of an off year for being warmer than normal, uh, next year is going to be even better. Yeah. If you um, if you had to say what products and services that you offer, what would you say? So, 
I offer over 850 varieties of heirloom seeds. Oh, that's, wow. And her link's cool. below, guys. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's right. That's right. Definitely use the link in your, in your, you uh, stuff going on. Like, it, yeah, I, I want you to elaborate on the question. So and then... There's everything on my website is heirloom, open pollinated, non-hybrid, non-GMO. So it's a mouthful to explain. It's an heirloom seed. You can save those seeds and grow them next year. Um, but I also offer a, a couple kits. Um, especially for new new people, I'm trying to read the comments at the same time. Um, I offer kits, which are good for people, especially if they're just getting started. Uh, and one of the probably one of the biggest, um, most common feedback I get from customers is that I make it simple. Uh, I don't want to make you go and look at this and go, oh, I, that's just I'm overwhelmed. I'm not going to do it. Forget it. I'll go to the store. Mm -hmm. uh, so. If you can, I, I've found a way to kind of make it a lot simpler for people. Um, if you use the link. Send, you send like in detailed instructions. That That's actually what I consider my basic instructions. And online, there's even more detailed instructions yes. on it. So, uh, that's, that's the other part. And then the seed saving part of it as well. I know I uh, briefly touched on that, but. I've got a couple videos, but I've got a couple um, articles that you can actually read so you don't have to watch a video if you don't want to. Um, and that's to help you save some seeds as well. So hey, from, from from what's the what was your size property from California to Texas? Oh, uh, we had one and a half, I believe, acres there, and we have five acres here. Okay. That's a good size here. Yeah. We got Gardner State, Garden State Gardner said loves the germination rate awesome. from your seeds. Yes. Have you ever had like any cross pollination issues or anything like that? No, we, so that's one of the things we source. If, if I don't grow it, I source it from a small family gardener or seed grower that I've worked with for a really long time. Mm. That's so, good to know that. Yeah. Because yeah. there's corn, for example. You can't grow all of the varieties of corn that I carry. Um, so I make sure that I'm I'm working with somebody, A, who I trust, and B, who grows like I do. Um, we aren't certified organic, but we work with people who are or that grow natural, what I consider beyond organic standards, because not everybody knows that there are still uh, loopholes. Mm -hmm. that you organic know. standards. <laughs> yeah. So, and... There's plenty of, of organic gardeners out there that, that are more conscientious of how they grow, but at the same time, what I call beyond organic standards is we work with nature. So I don't just use as much organic herbicides and pesticides as I can use on my property. I actually don't use, I use next to none. Um, I prefer uh, working with nature. So we use uh, companion planting Mm -hmm. as my first line of defense i say so if it's easier to grow healthier plants than it is to fight the fight nature basically because nature always wins <laughs> yes yeah you know on that note since she did say that like what are your favorite trap crops in, so in, in the picture for your video is me holding a gigantic blue hubbard squash i meant it to ask you it yeah. is one of the best trap crops. Uh, you can grow it on the outside of your garden. And that picture is a 16 and a half pound blue Hubbard squash. When oh, I posted wow. it, yeah, it was, it was huge. There, you have to drop it on the ground and let it break in order to get it open because it, it has such a hard shell. Uh, but the great thing about that is it will store in cold storage for, for months, even up to almost a year. Um, if you plant it on the outside of your garden, that was one of the few that I actually harvested that year, but I still actually got a harvest. And that's probably one of my favorite. Um, but there's a lot of good ones you can you can do. And I don't, I don't plant in rows. I have kind of a chaos garden. Uh, I go all over the place with all my different um, companion plants. So I'll plant, say, your tomatoes, and then I'll plant a couple things around it so that I know that that should be 
beneficial to uh, to my tomato. Like borage is fantastic. Uh, nasturtiums are fantastic. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, if you've got root knot nematodes, you can actually chop up French marigold plants and use them as a green mulch or a green manure, and it can help deter or remove bad nematodes from your soil. Oh, so you have okay. to treat. I had never heard that no. one before. See, it, it, he's a big companion planter. Yeah, this too. year okay. was um, it was our first. Well, this year was our first year doing in ground, and I purposely planted a lot first of fl two. flowers and uh, different herbs to kind of to get rid of all. So, like this year, we didn't hardly use any. Um, this was our first year pesticides. of not using any of the natural. Things no like B neem oil no or BT, BT, none of that. Like so, we didn't have to it. yeah. So, all we've been doing is every in between seasons, just adding uh compost, uh, verma castings all into the soil, just amending yeah. smoke and soil. rabbit poop, and rabbit yeah. poop, of yeah. course. Yeah, speaking of that, what do you use to amend your soil? Since, since we know. just moved and I didn't have my homemade compost oh. or my manure. I actually found a local source for compost and raised bed mix. Um, I heard some great things about them and I did a little more research. I asked a lot of questions before I went ahead and did it. So being on a new property is tough because you don't know the lay of the land. So mm -hmm. I did no raised beds my first year. Um, I just, Threw a bunch of soil out and added some compost to it from um, it. They're called. I will have to remember it in a second because I it slipped my mind. But I added a bunch of compost and soil to the ground because I have heard about the Texas clay soil. Um, <laughs> Got it. And, and uh, I tried digging some fruit trees in fall and that was interesting. Mm. Uh, I got about six inches deep and it was so hard there was no way i was going to do it so i went a couple feet further and i could dig down a couple feet so you know you're you're learning a lot here um so what i did was i just threw everything in the ground and i was like i got a couple months i know it's a short a short grow time for me and the first good rain we had here <laughs> oh, yeah, I love rain after coming from from southern california <laughs> we had an average of 16 inches a year and Ben Wheeler Texas has an average of 46 inches a year yeah. it was amazing but <laughs> the rain went from one end of the property straight through the garden to the other side of the property mm. so within a month I'm starting over and I thought well now I've got a path through my garden <laughs> and I've got I've got a side here that's high and a side here that's high. And then the water just went straight through. So learning how the property works, I didn't want to put anything there that would be permanent right away. Uh, so this year we did raised beds. Um, in Ramona, we could only do raised beds because it was infested with gophers. Uh, mm. I thought, at one point the house was going to come down because there were so many gopher holes outside. I, I didn't know how the house was still standing. <laughs> so uh, we have a question for you, uh, Terry McKinney. She says, or they say the sun destroyed my soil this year. Because and she's of, in Minnesota. Uh, what she wants to know, what do she do? I would like to get your intake and I'll probably do my, my perspective on it, what she could do. Okay. Um, now I'm curious how you know your son with your the son destroyed your soil mm -hmm. um, because there's a lot of of aspects of your soil that you may be either lacking or maybe you need to test it out. So it depends. If you had diseased plants, it's possible that you needed to add some nutrients to your soil or even just a simple compost. Uh, generally, when you solarize your soil, you're killing the bad bacteria, and that's actually a good thing for your soil. I mentioned um, root knot nematodes earlier. That's your second option for, um, for getting rid of the root knot nematodes is solarizing. 
And unless you do a soil test for your garden, you really don't want to just throw a bunch of, of nutrients in there or um, harsh fertilizers that may not be beneficial to what you need. So I would, I would say my recommendation is to have your soil tested first before you start adding more stuff. Uh, and if you don't have that option, you can always honestly simply add a layer of compost. It's not, I mean, I talk about poop a lot in my different videos because um, there is a benefit to using manures, but you don't necessarily want to just throw a bunch of manure on there and hope it works. Um, and then lastly, if your soil got scorched, you may need to add a layer of mulch. Uh, that way your soil retains your water and you're not just raining and then drying it up and you're done. So that's my two cents. That was my number one thing was I was going to say definitely mulch if you feel that you're your uh, the sun has definitely scorched or whatever your your soil uh that's going to be your number one protecting of your uv rays the comment that she has is about powder mildew squash bugs what terry uh said that it's powder mildew squash bugs Oh, so what what uh terry what were your plants that you you because it sounds like with powdery mildews and squash bugs, you had some type of uh, winter squash or something, some winter squash or summer squash around that area. Um, Do you see the comment that you can put up there? I don't. It's down a little bit further. Oh, here we go. Yeah, there we go. I got powdery mildew, squash bugs, white butterfly eggs. So, yeah, I think it's, it's not just soil. It's just uh, certain, certain squashes. Um, and pumpkins, melons, all of those uh, attract. So, what you would probably want to she do. She needs some trap. Uh, yeah, some like, trap crops like. Um, what Mary was saying yeah. and what we've been. Or, what is your thought on that, Mary? So, number one with powdery mildew, as soon as you see something like that pop up, you should take a clean pair of uh, shear implements, if scissors, if you have them, and just remove that and throw it in the trash. Do not put it in your compost pile. Um, and then wash those scissors off when you're done. Um, yeah. But before you do that, you should, if you have a variety, like you mentioned, a winter squash or um, a melon, you want to make sure that your plants have airflow. Yes. Because if your plants are crammed in there, I love the square foot garden method but you do have to make sure that when you are planting something that is more likely to get uh, powdery mildew, that you give it a little space because that it, when you have humidity, you've got water and you've got plants that are cramped up together, you are most likely just setting yourself up for powdery mildew. Yeah. Um, mm, this, prune, prune. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. If, and if, if you get to a point and I've done it before, if you get to a point where you have a plant that is beyond repair, Pull it out because if you don't pull it out, you're going to infect the rest of your garden and then you might lose more than just one single plant. Mm -hmm. You struggle with that. Yeah. I'm the one that will pull it. <laughs> I, at, I have such a hard time doing that. <laughs> Star um, Master, I appreciate you. Oh. Uh, thank you for so much for the super chat. Thank you oh so much. God, that is so sweet. Uh, uh, going back to the powdery mil mildew is uh, a lot of those plants, uh, I consider I got, I got, okay. a lot of those plants uh, like cucumbers and all that, You they have runners. And sometimes, depending on what you want to grow, either for mass or for production, you definitely want to cut off those, uh, those suckers because they will put off new runners. And that's how you could possibly decrease your chances of getting that powdery mildew. All right, so Star Massiner, uh, since he gave it a super, super chat there, he's they or he or she uh, said the best organic fertilizers for carrots. Mines are small. Now you used to do different type of manures at your old place, so and you got this compost now. For us, we'd like to use uh, either the rabbit manure, the compost, or the vermicompost. Vermicompost, yeah. Uh, what do you suggest? 
for carrots. I always said that the soil is loose, like really, really loose. That's a big yeah. thing. That is my number one, actually. If your carrots are small, I don't usually recommend throwing a fertilizer at it and hoping it grows. Number one is check your, the I call it fluffiness of your soil. So you mm -hmm. really want, those carrots are going to be stunted or they're going to be misshapen. You always see those funny pictures of carrots where they're, you know, their the roots are all mangled up. Most likely it's because you've got a harder, um, you've got a harder or, or, or a tougher soil. So that was one of the things that we had with our clay soil. I had to dump mounds and mounds of compost above ground because I didn't want to just wreck the soil and over till. Um, I did till a couple places to see how um, how much clay it was, and it was just clay. So I figured I would rather just build up than try and fight what I what I had going. And sometimes it's not no. Most of the time, it's not a quick fix. Um, a garden is a process, so you really want to feed your soil more than you want to uh, feed your plants, really. I mean, a healthy soil is going to feed your plants. We um, have so, yeah. Uh, and Cindy's actually asking the same thing. How do you break up the clay soil? Um, mm -hmm. I actually don't use peat moss because it's a little more acidic. Um, I use a lot of fallen leaves, a lot of fallen pieces we have here on the property. Uh, like we discussed, I moved here a year ago, so getting to know the property was important. Um, I've gathered so many different uh, just buckets of organic matter from the property, making sure they weren't, you know, uh, I was warned, make sure there aren't like snakes and spiders in there when you're trying to gather them, but just okay. add as much organic as you can. <laughs> Yeah, uh, uh, with the with with the comp with the clay soil, a lot of people think clay soil is bad. Clay soil is probably the best soil that you can get because it has a lot of micronutrients and nutrients. That for you, the only bad thing about clay soil, it holds water. Yes, uh, it's got to just constantly just add a a lot of organic matter, allow it to break down and get into the your soil. The lasagna method yeah. has been what has made our garden be what it is. Yeah. Yeah. So do it's, 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 I mean, it's we a, literally like put cardboard down. Like we literally layered and mm -hmm. lay and built on it. So gardening is a marathon. It's not a sprint. Like she was saying, you just got to, it's about three to five years. You will improve that by that time frame. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Tara wants to know, she got the, the, with the powdery mildew. Oh no, it wasn't this question. I got thrown off here. Uh, yeah. You cannot wash powdery mildew away. You can, you can stop it from spreading. Uh, there's different ways you can clip off the leaves. You can use yeah. uh, hydrogen peroxide uh, spray, the food grade kind, and spray it on there. That allows the oxygen or the baking soda. Would extra. you say the best thing is to just cut it off with the clean? I prefer to cut it off. Yeah. Uh, it's yes, you can treat it like you're mentioning, and I've I I generally give my customers a whole list of options that they can choose. Um, but at the end of the day, my choice is generally just to trim it off. And mm. if you're checking your plants regularly, it you won't walk out one day and your entire plant is infested. If no. you're looking at it, you're checking out the underside of the leaves and you're not spreading it with, with your hands. If you touch that powdery mildew, don't touch other, other things. And that's why I mentioned uh, to um, make sure you tr you clean everything when you use it. Uh, thank you, Sarah, for so much for the super chat 1999. Uh, talking about I'm excited about your American breast. There's not enough money to give for you for your secret recipe lessons. <laughs> oh, that was really <laughs> sweet. I I don't know if you knew that. That was kind of our thing. Um, I, I do you have any animals on your property yet? We don't. Other than the cats. Other than the cats. We, yes, we do have the cats. They're indoor only. They're not outside, uh, but we don't have any yet. Again, because I wanted to see the lay of the of of the property. And our last place, we did have chickens. 
Um, and we had horses next door. So that's how I had uh, access to horse manure at all times. Um, but we will definitely be getting chickens as soon as, as soon as we get the front fence fixed, because in the last storm we lost the front fence. As soon as that's up, then we can get set for chickens. Something that we're kind of having a, or a reputation for in this area is uh, the very popular American breast. We are NPIP certified and um, by accident, we never set out to be breeders, by the way. I have been following your adventure, so I have seen that. Yeah, uh, so that was really neat that, uh, that our subscriber here was, um, shouting that out. <laughs> Rick was saying, can't you use milk or diluted milk for powder? Yes, you can You can also use milk because it. what you do is just you uh, disturb the pH balance of it. And so that, that milk is more of a, a base. And so it just disturbs and kind of equalizes it and whatnot. I would think that if you're going to do experiments though, like that, that you would need to be like, be able to, check it a lot yeah. um if you can't cut <clears throat> but like like she was saying if you check it on the regular and you prune it and allow the airflow uh for your plants you it definitely will help out a lot uh terry said i think there was the scissors with the culprit uh <laughs> got some germs on them scissors so when you when you uh if you're gonna uh prune or anything of your sears or your products of that you're in the garden do you use peroxide what do you use to kind of sterilize your your tools i generally use a soap and then just wipe it down with rubbing alcohol okay because then then i'm clear and i make sure obviously i wash my hands um and if i'm depending on what i'm doing i'll use my regular garden gloves but otherwise i'm using maybe even a um what do you call the gloves? The nitro gloves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That way I don't have to throw away my garden gloves every time I have something like that out in the garden. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I, uh, the missus was telling me about something about your school gardening thing. That you're oh, programming. I think that this is a, such a cool thing that you do um, is you do like a donation uh, for school gardens. And I, I wanted you to kind of like elaborate on that. Cause I think that that's a, a really great project and I admire that. And I think that that's actually something that's lacking a lot in education systems. <laughs> yeah. It's an, it's an eye opener when you start getting involved with schools. Uh, so my current, we donate to schools around the U S um, last year was about almost 150 schools, or I should say gardens. So it is school gardens, it's community gardens, it's 4-H club gardens, uh, veterans uh, gardens, whether it's at a, uh, maybe it's an American Legion post or something that they put together. Um, or some people have approached me and they just have a space that they have for veterans gardens, um, elderly centers even. Uh, but primarily at school gardens. Uh, I got my start volunteering in schools in so, uh, Southern Cal, so, not Southern California. That was the big school um, in Hollywood, Florida. It oh, wow. was it was a Title One school where uh, you know I talked to the teachers and she's saying you know some of these kids they only eat when they're here for breakfast and lunch. So you're looking at kids that may not have access to fresh food at home. Uh, so that was kind of an eye opener for me. Uh, I was fortunate to not grow up that way. So when you when you see these kids and you have a chance to really connect with them, um, I bring uh, handfuls of nasturtium seeds and I tell them it looks like monkey brains and they get all excited and <laughs> that gets some attention because it's weird. Um, or, you know, I ask them about different pollinators. How did you like, did you know that these are pollinators, like bats and lemurs, uh, some things that you don't necessarily, you know, we, we, everybody knows about the honeybee, but did you know that, that lemurs, you know, that, you know, character from their movie they're watching or something, you know? So it's, it's super exciting to me. I did have an opportunity in, uh, I think it was, I want to say Poway, but I'm not hundred percent sure. 
it was a big school. A lady reached out to me and she said, we have this garden. It's a massive garden. And would you come teach our kids? Hmm. And that, that scared me to death. <laughs> so, <laughs> because you're not just dealing with one class at that point. I had um, six to eight classes. It was a one day event. And then it was anywhere from 15 to 30 kids per class. And they all got to get their hands in the dirt and they all got to plant seeds and they all got to put them in their greenhouse. And we talked about all the different things. And this garden was massive. They had a grant from, I believe, the USDA uh, specifically for school garden programs. And yeah. that really is what kicked me off. So I do it every year and it's probably the most exciting part of the year for me. <laughs> That's awesome. I, 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 have you uh, connected with a school in Texas like that? And I'm only asking because you're not very far from me. So if you did something like that, I would love to be your assistant. I um, have not yet. Um, and that was the sad part. I got a little I got a little weepy on on my YouTube bit video trying to talk about it not long ago. When COVID hit, the school gardens took a hit. You know, mm -hmm. the, yeah, you had more. Uh, distance learning and there wasn't a lot of of people able to do it the kids weren't able to do it and we're finally getting back to where everybody's back in the garden again so I am hoping this year uh, to be able to do a hands-on out of school um, I do have a friend who lives right down the road for me and I'm hoping that maybe they will uh, she might do a 4-H garden as well so I would love to go sit and talk to them um, so I will, if I do it again, I fingers crossed, I can, I mean, it's not an, if I am willing to do it, it's if somebody gives me the opportunity to do it, I'll definitely hit you up for it, for it as, a, as an assistant. As an assistant, like I'm a great secretary. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But it's, it's, it's but good. I have kids and I, okay. Okay. Not all kids. <laughs> kids are kind of jerky. Okay. I have a love hate relationship. <laughs> When it comes to like, it's so easy to get kids to actually eat certain things if they're involved in a different kind of way, like introducing them to yep. growing. Um, Junior's not a big vegetable person, uh -huh. right? his son. <laughs> and, um, I have had a passion for the past 10 years like getting him to eat stuff that he normally would not. <laughs> so, <laughs> but with kids, like that's a fun thing for me. Now yeah. you, you do this full time. This is your full time job. It is now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I have worn many hats. Uh, when I was in South Florida, I ran uh, a chiropractic wellness, wellness office. Uh, my husband was in the office and we had a couple other doctors there. And then on the weekends, I went to a farmer's market. So I had a seven day a week running schedule. Uh, when I was in California, it was the seeds and uh, the skate shop. And now it is definitely full time, seven days a week uh, seeds. We just finally hired a friend to help part time. And she's she's becoming almost full time now. So I'm actually able to take a Sunday off and not have to worry about it. I can shut the door <laughs> and walk away. Um, but yes, it is definitely my full time these days. That's C a blessing. Cindy Mobley said, even if lockdown, we need Mary's herb garden in our kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, for everybody that's in the chat, what is your favorite type in? In the comments down below, what is your favorite herb that you love to cook with? For us, I think for me, it's garlic. Um, and and you have said several times the basil because yeah, you basil. the pesto that I make from the basil. What about you, Mary? Yeah, I'm a big herb person. Uh, basil, hands down. Uh, <laughs> yeah. What, what <laughs> favorite? What well, is your favorite basil? Okay, so I should probably I should probably add a little asterisk to that. <laughs> For cooking, I love garlic because I keep a, I, I'm looking at some garlic I harvested not that long ago. We grow a massive amount of garlic and I keep a bowl of it in my kitchen. We love garlic. But basil, it would have to be number one, one, because you can't make pesto without the two of them. Yeah. Um, but also I make a purple basil lemonade that is 
probably one of my favorite things to drink in the summertime. I need that recipe. What is <laughs> okay. a purple basil lemonade? Okay, so I have a video on it, uh, and it's a it's printed on my website as well. It is dark purple opal basil. Okay. It has a slight, almost cinnamony clove flavor to it. So it's not your typical green basil. And I put that in a jar. I squeeze a uh, half a lemon into it. If you if you don't do sugar, you can do like a stevia or honey. Some people do sugar, so it just depends on what you like. Uh, you can omit it if you don't really like it. And then you pour hot water over it and you let it sit. And it makes the most beautiful pink lemonade, but it has a completely different flavor than a regular lemonade. It's it's awesome. Oh, interesting. So what was the, the, the basil tea I was making this? The Thai basil. Yeah, that was, was, was it was our first year basil. growing Thai yeah. basil. And I normally don't like licorice, but in the, as when we do it as a tea, it's delicious. It's the only use I found for it, yeah. actually. It's been yeah. but using that, that as a tea is perfect. And using the purple basil as a pesto, if you are a visual person, is probably not the best either because it just comes out brown. It, yeah. you know, oh. it's yeah. not a pretty, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's pretty as a garnish. But not necessarily as a as a pesto. It looks a little funny. Yeah, for years I've been doing tons of pesto and preserving it and like uh, putting it in like uh, little muffin pans and freezing and like having the little discs. I love to put it on some pasta. Been making it for a long time. Emma from Sunny's Place says she just ordered your three sister garden seed combo. And she's so excited to try it. I've, we tried to do that twice and just. It was because, okay, so to be fair, that was in a sh in, in our in our um, garden in the place before we moved here. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of shade. And yeah. I, I think that that wasn't a fair test. Well, you, you have to time it so right with your corn to your peas and to your whatever winter squash that you grow on. I just don't think that we had the good foundation yeah. when we started it. So we need to try it again here now that our soil is where it should be. Yeah. It's been and taking a while. There's a few uh, reasons sometimes that they fail besides uh, being in a shade. You need to choose a variety of corn that's strong and sturdy. Uh, and those are usually the, the flint corn or the field corn varieties, uh, not necessarily a sweet corn. Ah, uh, That's good to know. That because you have to have that base, that foundation for your your peas or your your beans. Uh, the Three Sisters Garden has rattlesnake pole beans, so that's a really good one. It's an easy to grow one, and it it provides a lot. Uh, and then it's Jarhadale pumpkin. I don't know what it is with blue crops. I really like blue. So a Jarhadale is actually a, a slate gray, almost like a light blue pumpkin. Huh. Okay. Mm -hmm. We got Rob from Ession's Family Garden says he loves ordering seeds from you. I didn't even know. Yeah. That, that, um, <laughs> now we have had our biggest failure actually this year. He said that he's never going to grow corn again. Yeah. We've had nothing but failure growing corn. The time that we, <laughs> what was that stuff that we, that like happened on it that people were some type us of some type of mold on mold. there that they claim it's a delicacy. It. I'm like, uh, I'm good. <laughs> I'm not trying it's that. Mutt. Yes, smut. mutt. Yeah, I'm like, mm, smut the billy goats. No, I'm good. I'm not trying that mess. <laughs> he wasn't ready to explore. And the time that we did grow corn and we pretty well. I took a bit of it uh, in one of our videos and, and I left it and put it off on the side of the uh, on the counter and stuff later on. And then like later on, she's like, we, she showed me that the corn was had some uh, tobacco worm corn. I'm like, oh my God. I'm like, I'm never doing that ever again. Oh my God. I, I felt sick. I, it took me a while to even eat corn again. When I was a kid, my mom told me that we had a garden out in the backyard and and when she served us a salad with our dinner, I had a worm in my salad bowl and I said, I didn't ever want to eat food from the garden again. <laughs> <laughs>
And here I am still eating from the garden. But so there's a couple things that a lot of people don't necessarily realize. Um, <laughs> you want to say hi or thank you? <laughs> well, I, yeah, this yes, thing I, I'm listening. I am listening. I appreciate it, Star. And have a good one. So it depends on what you're growing uh, as far as a corn variety. I've had a lot of, of customers ask me, you know, is it edible? I have a video on it's ornamental because I've had so many conversations with people. They go, oh, well, it looks pretty. Is it just for decoration? Um, and there's very little I sell seed wise that's just for decoration. So um, the important thing is to find something, a variety that you like. So if you like sweet corn um, or if you're growing it as a popcorn, uh, hands down, my favorite is glass gem corn. It grows beautiful. It looks like little jewels and it pops really well if you allow it to dry long enough. Uh, but the pests are definitely an issue and pollination is an issue. Uh, corn is wind pollinated. So if you have a, a 20 foot row and you only plant that 20 foot row, the chances of your, your corn being a good harvest are, are fairly low. I plant in what I call clumps or clusters or squares, and you, you plant it a little closer together. I, I tend to break the rules when it comes to planting in the garden. I don't necessarily use my little, um, I don't use anything to measure exactly how long it is. I just kind of wing it and I just eyeball it because maybe just because I've been doing it long enough, but I don't take a tape measure out there and make sure it's exactly four inches apart. So you plant your seeds and you want to make sure for corn that it's close together, but then also that you provide again, something that's going to either deter pests or attract crop. So that might be helpful for you is planting something that maybe will, will take those worms or whatever it is away from those. Yeah. What do you what do you suggest on that? Because it seems like tobacco worms are have been our nemesis. Well, so, this year was locusts. There's and no locusts. way there was locusts no way. And, yeah. <laughs> There's no way to stop those. So yeah, you can't you can't treat all of those. You can't yeah. deter all of those. I that was one thing that I is completely new to me is the locusts or. Um, Grasshoppers, whatever you want to call them, whatever you whatever you call them, they were they're really pretty sometimes. But they're really <laughs> <laughs> I love to grab them and feed them to a chicken. Yeah, like mm -hmm. as soon as. <laughs> so in in Florida, you have something called a lover, and it's a little prettier of a variety of of grasshopper. And people complain that the chickens won't even eat them; they're so annoying. Oh. I, I saw this beautiful creature on my door and I thought, I, I can't kill it. I just, I'll let it go. Um, well, the next year I lost so much of my garden because it just <laughs> spread all over my garden. So I learned my lesson in that one. There are some things that I will grow with nature and there will some things that need to go if I want to harvest something. So um, yeah, that, that's definitely an issue. Um, this year I grew a uh, coolie purple corn and it grew pretty well considering it's a brand new spot. So I haven't really added a lot to that area. Um, and I grew around the um, corn. I grew moon and stars, yellow flesh watermelon. Hmm. I was going to ask what your trap crop was around corn. So you would say watermelon. That it worked this year. I, I won't say that that's going to work next year because kind of no, every day, every, every, year, year, so. <laughs> every, every year might be different, but that was definitely one that I did lose some uh, to, I lost some of the watermelon, uh, but I did still get my corn. So that's an option for you. So uh, I want to know what is one crop that you will always have in your garden and everybody else comment down in the description. What is one crop that you will always have in your garden? A crop or a seed variety? <laughs> or both. Oh, that, yeah, that's good to ask. And, and then why? Because and, yeah, and why? 
because um, like there's certain crops that she would plant as a trap. Mm -hmm. For me, it's during the summer, it's okra. During the fall, winter time here in Texas is always collard, collard greens. greens so. Yeah. And rosemary. So rosemary makes the best collard greens. Rosemary around here is considered a perennial, but this it will grow nonstop. So yep. I, I have a hard time picking just one because I have so many that I've grown. So I'll say I, I've got a couple. Uh, okay. for, for flavor, I will always grow tomatoes. Uh, heirloom tomatoes are so fantastic. And that really what is, is what kept me in the garden for so long. My granny grew the best tomatoes ever. People would come to her house just to make a sandwich from her homegrown tomatoes. Um, so that's my favorite. Uh, Cherokee purple is my favorite uh, variety. It doesn't, it doesn't have your super sweet taste like some varieties, but it's really good. Um, but this year I'm planning on being more intentional with my food storage. Uh, I feel like there are some things that I could definitely add to my garden this year that, or I should say in 2023, that I planted and that did really well and surprised me. Uh, and that's gonna be the seminal pumpkin. So I mentioned it earlier in the video and recently I posted to my Facebook page and had to share with all my customers. Um, this is a seminal pumpkin. It's not your typical uh, pumpkin. This is a smaller uh, one that I harvested. This is over a year old and it's still delicious. Yes. So just before Thanksgiving, I cut one open. I did an experiment this year. Well, I harvested these back in October of 21, which means they grew pretty quickly. Uh, and I put this in a cabinet in my kitchen that wasn't close to anything hot, so not close to my oven. Uh, and I just sat it there. I have a couple of them. And I grew some this year, and I've been eating them. And I cut it open just before Thanksgiving, and it was still very flavorful it wasn't rotted it wasn't moldy and this one was the best out of the four different varieties of pumpkins that i put on uh put in a cabinet to see how long they would last um and this one lasted this is from um this is a a wild pumpkin from florida that has a very long history as well what, what's the name of it again seminal pumpkin okay. so the Seminole tribe of Native Americans is based in Florida, from what I understand. Uh, and they actually will grow up a tree. So there, there's a long history. I'll, if you look on my website, you'll see a, a, a description of it. But the Native Americans were able to almost hide their food uh, from, from people that were coming through because it was growing in the trees. It's, it's a really neat variety. So Brampton Gardner, our Canadian neighbor, uh, says uh, she grows the tomato Tasmanian chocolate dwarf tomatoes. Have you ever heard of that? I have not heard of it. I'll have to look it up, though. Oh, that sounds interesting. I'm going to have to look it. <laughs> um, we had terrible luck with tomatoes this past year, except for our our Borghese. Our Borghese and Aroma tomatoes. Yeah. Okay. The aromas, the variegated aromas. And it the it would just got too hot for it. We, we it started growing our Cherokee uh, tomatoes and our Dr. Uh, White Way cheese. too much real estate was put towards tomatoes that might cost too much. To yeah. Like they're, <laughs> it was not worth it <laughs> this year. Anna from Sunny's Place said, I will be growing sweet potatoes from here on out before I grew them because it was fun to have something Matt could eat. Oh, oh okay. Yeah, good. because Matt has some health um, yeah. stuff. Yeah, that's a good one. Okay. The Seminole. So something I like totally geeked out about that I actually learned from you was about the um, the the Puna Cara cucumber. Um, yes. So, yeah, I saw like a picture and then I saw some stuff and I got like totally like that was a, a cucumber I wanted. I never heard of them before. Um, can you talk about that cucumber a little bit? And do you have a picture? Uh, of what? Of the Puna 
because it, it it it's like a it, it's a brown cuc it like well it can turn into a brown cucumber but it's supposed to be a really great like salad cucumber oh. yeah mm -mm. um i don't have since it's a newer variety i don't have all of that memorized in my head but it it is interesting that you can eat it small and i believe it's a yellowish color uh mm -hmm. cucumber and then as it grows it almost looks like a russet potato Yes. So I really liked that it has, one, it has a long history, and two, it is a more heat-tolerant variety. Because of its origins, it, it can kind of survive a little more uh, rough heat, like similar to the Seminole Pumpkin or the Okra. Uh, it's something that has a little more tolerance. So and it's not the kind of thing that you would want to pickle or anything. This would be better for, like, salads, sandwiches. It's Yep, it's definitely a slicing cucumber. It's not something, uh, I, I did learn a, a little bit about different types of cucumbers. Um, the, the White Wonder, for example, wasn't the best uh, pickling cucumber. Um, the Punakira is not a good pickling cucumber, um, but things like- With cucumbers, right? You mm -hmm. like cucumbers? Well, yeah, I pickle. So we, like this whole, this past year was like a, um, it was kind of an eye opener, like actually utilizing actual pick. What was the um, the one that we use for pickling? I'm trying. Per, per, Persian, at Persian, the Persian or something they, like they that. They were per, they were Persian pickling cucumbers. Okay. Uh, for all, like I pickled all of those, and but you had a slicer that you liked this last year. Well, it was the the normal. Um, it was like what you could get at a store, but obviously something, better. Something it was organic. 76. But the market more. Market more. The market more. The more. Yeah. yeah. But I That's think the Kara, like I, I want to put it neck and neck this upcoming year with the market more. I want to compete with his slicer. And see. <laughs> it's not my slicer. I didn't make well, it. Well, it's the one that... <laughs> It, it, he brought that to the table, so I'm. We're competitive, like we're very competitive <laughs> with each other. Yeah. So the Puna Cara is. I'm. I'm bringing to the table. We're gonna. Yeah. So Sarah, wants to know what is? Uh, do you have a favorite spaghetti squash variety? And uh, the. Oh, I need to know that. Yeah. I don't. I don't have. I only carry one variety of sp spaghetti squash, and it's just your standard spaghetti squash. I know there are some varieties out there that they've um, I hybridized, but then stabilized those hybrids. So they're a little older, but not quite. So we just grow the standard spaghetti squash, um, like similar to the butternut squash. They've made some adjustments and now they have something called a honey nut. I think it is um, not something we carry, but we carry the Waltham butternut, which is your standard really old variety. So I don't necessarily know that I have a favorite um, it's, we only carry one. So I, that's the only one I grow. Um, I don't grow a lot of butternut squash cause I would be the only one in the house that would eat it. And I can only eat so Not much. <laughs> <laughs> so, speaking of that, what is besides butternut squash and everybody else comment down below, what is one vegetable that you would never, ever grow again? Honestly, I think that's the only one. Uh, oh. Butternut. Yeah, butternut. butternut. And and it's only because my husband will not eat it. He was he was raised on like some kind of boiled butternut soup, and what? he came home one day and I was cooking butternut in the oven, and he goes, he says that butternut. I go, yeah. He goes, call me when you're done cooking it, and he walked out the door, back on his motorcycle, and went back to work. <laughs> <laughs> so it's one of those things that I'll, I'll eat butternut out, but I don't grow it. Um, uh, I I like even lima beans, and he doesn't like lima beans, but I'll definitely grow those because forget it. Um, I eggplant. Cindy says I love eggplant, so that's it's not one. I will say this: I'm learning to cook okra because I wasn't raised in the South. South. I was raised in the west south so <laughs> avocado eaters and not okra eaters so 
the first time I ever made it, it was slimy, slimy and uh, thumbs up to my husband. He actually ate it. Uh, but He's from Texas. he did say it was a little slimy. So I'm going to have to learn how to fry it up like he was used to and see if I can figure it out from there. If you roast it just right long enough, it, like roasting it, um, um, works out, but I prefer pickling them in a yes. very huge and spicy way. I love the spicy and not same. just great spice, a really hot spice. Yes, same. Yes. <laughs> See, for, for me, it's going to be eggplant. We grew eggplant one year and we did very well, but it was like, okay, I'm tired of eggplant. <laughs> I, don't, I don't really like it enough. Like, I don't want to dedicate any real estate to it. I don't yeah. like it that much. Yeah. So yeah, it's that and corn for you. Well, the only the reason right, yeah, I love I, corn, I, but I won't grow corn because of the failure. But I might have to. What you were saying, do with either the maize or I mean, the. I told him. I was like, he was like, <laughs> I'm done. I'm never gonna grow it again. And I was like, mm, I bet you do. Anyway. I have a video on popping the glass gem corn and saving the seeds from the corn. It's not your typical sweet corn. Uh, but you can use it as a cornmeal. And if you dry it long enough, it does do really well as a popcorn. But it's not something you're necessarily going to eat. I did try it, just to say I tried it. And it is not an eating on the cob sweet corn. <laughs> All oh, right. Sarah asked if, um, oh, yeah, tree cat. We have a. Yeah, we have a walk, walking stick uh, kale where we're all right now. Actually, we grew it last year and it's still growing. We so. still have it. It grew yeah. all through summer. It lasted yeah. through the, the triple digit heat that we had. Mm -hmm. um, well, it was growing underneath a tree, but. Yeah, we had it in the shade, which you should do. Go ahead. Yeah. So we're wrapping up. Mary, how can everyone find you? What are your social media outlets? Your and I, we did put in, in the links below mm -hmm. uh, how to reach you um, through your website. Um, but do you have any upcoming things that you would like to let people know about? Definitely. Uh, so you can find me on Instagram, on uh, YouTube, obviously. Um, I have a Twitter account, but I, it's just mainly just to say, hey, I'm there because I'm not really active. Uh, I got enough going on in the garden that I, I can't do all of the social media. Um, I am more active on Instagram and YouTube and Facebook. Uh, I do have the third annual. I've been doing this now for three years. In January, I do plant for pollinators. Um, so if you use uh, the link that you guys have in your um, for your video and you scroll down to the very bottom of the page, you can sign up for my email list. I send an email to our customers. I do not sell your information. It is only for um, heirloom seed information. And the reason I do it in January is because January is usually the time people are planning out their gardens and they're kind of working on what do I want to grow, what works, what didn't work, and how can I expand really this year. So the plant for pollinators, I discuss different ways you can integrate pollinator plants in your garden because studies show that you can actually increase crop production by including more pollinators and using less fertilizer. So mm -hmm. we want people to, to have a beneficial, a healthy garden without having to use as all the inputs you can possibly find. All right. And that's something that I'm interested in. So yeah. if y'all have any questions, make sure you can go to Mary's and her Instagram. That's probably the best way for her to reach her. Definitely the best way to reach and us. That's the reason that I even wanted to have you uh, on here is you are very interactive with anybody with questions. Like you're very yeah. transparent. You go out of your way to help people grow um, and that's just something that I wanted to highlight actually on our channel. Sure. You can, you can actually send me an email. Uh, my email is simple. It's Mary at Mary's heirloom uh, Give me a little time to, to respond because it does get crazy, but I typically respond within two days and I will answer your questions, whether you've ordered from me or not. Um, I'll still try and answer your questions. Same, same, same. Thank you so much for joining. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. 
Thank you so much. And also thank everyone. Thank Emma from Sunny's Place for being one of our moderators out here to putting out the links. Yeah, she just had a really great video actually on starting over in her garden. <laughs> we literally watched her tear her whole garden down. So, oh, go check that out. <laughs> all right, all right. Thank you. For everybody that's watching this on the replay, we do these videos the first Saturday of each month at 7 p.m. And we're trying to increase that, actually. Yeah, we're trying to, but it's just <laughs> getting getting the host and everything of that nature in my time frame. And yeah. it's just busy, busy, busy. <laughs> to be a slow season is just still busy. <laughs> yep. Thank you so much, Mary. Thanks for having me. Have a great one. All Good right, you. you too. Good evening.